It is a Mackie and Judd production, but it is the bonus scoop Tuesday with our guy Darren Doogie Wolfson, Channel 5 Eyewitness News, of course, Score North, the Scoop Podcast. Declan Goff is always executive producing. All right, Darren. Bravo and congratulations. A week ago on this show, a week ago on this show, you brought up uh, what ESPN.com reported today. What can you tell us about the fact that the wolf sale to A-Rod and his partner is is not done yet? The window has passed. But as you said, that doesn't mean it's falling apart. It just means it's not done within the allotted time that we thought it might get done. Exactly. Good afternoon, Judd. Good afternoon, Declan. Judd, I have every reason to believe that the deal still gets done, that they can extend this negotiating window. The sides are negotiating in good faith until I hear otherwise. Now, hey, I said it at the time, Judd. I still, for the life of me, can't comprehend how a transaction of this magnitude, $1.5 billion, got negotiated in a couple powwow sessions at Glenn's Naples, Florida home over the course of like four or five days. That just blows me away. So it's not shocking that now 32 days later, 33 days later, yes, there are some sticking points. I am led to believe one of the sticking points is we have this loose plan of Glenn remaining majority owner for two and a half years. If yeah. you're A-Rod, if you're Lori, and you're spending that much money, why the heck do you want Glenn to be in charge for that long? I understand. Trust me, as I've done some background to work on Lori and A-Rod, make sure. no mistake about this. Those two will need all sorts of help. And I get it. Mark Lori, incredible businessman. But running a sports franchise is a lot different than creating diapers.com, right? Or helping Walmart's e-commerce you know, side of things. So they will need all sorts of help. So I understand the idea, regardless of what fans think of Glenn, Glenn being on, you know, all these different boards, having ownership since the mid nineties, knowing where all the bodies are buried, knowing everyone that having him as a resource for some length of time, I get it. I think that does make sense. But for two and a half years, Judd, that for the life of me, will never make sense. Why does Glenn need to remain majority owner you wouldn't. until winter of 2023? Well, to your point, Dukes, consultant makes perfect sense. Like, I can call Glenn if something goes wrong, right? Or I have a question. That makes perfect sense. But to own the team still? And and it, was this at Glenn's insistence? Do we know? Did Glenn say? No. Like, you that's know my, what? Yeah. Now... If anything, I've learned over the years in my conversations with Glenn, he's been too forthcoming. That I haven't caught Glenn. Remember always Journalism 101. Why is this person lying to me? But getting to know Glenn for many, many years, if anything, he just won't answer the occasional question I throw his way or won't respond to a text message. But when we do engage in conversation, I've seen him at different points say too much, probably reveal too much. I know it got under Tibbs's skin and Scott Layden's skin a few years ago, how revealing he was with me and with others. So Glenn told me, Judd, again, for what it's worth, Glenn told me this was an A-Rod and Mark Laurie idea that they insist that Glenn remains on in some capacity. Okay, but there's a difference between a capacity, like I'll help you, and you still own the team for two plus years. Like, well, that, and I think that's that's, that's a big one leap. of the sticking points, right? And Glenn said, I asked Glenn directly, even after A Rod and Lori become majority owners, yep. will you still own some sort of stake, whether that's twenty percent, fifteen percent? I don't think it'll be much below ten to fifteen percent. I think it'll right. be in that fifteen to twenty percent ballpark. He said yes, that even after A Rod and Lori become majority owners. Glenn is going to remain on as a limited partner. Okay. Uh, do we know, too, and this is is probably beyond what we can definitively say, Dukes, but do we know, too, is there a chance that A-Rod and Lori went to the league to get a full interpretation of a potential move? Because, you know, it's one thing to tell Glenn, Glenn, we're keeping the team here, and it's never going to leave. And it's a different thing to have to go to the league and the league saying, um, Seattle, 
is a place where we're going to expand to and get billions for. You can't go there. Vegas, same thing. Do we think that there's a potential that in doing their due diligence of what the situation is with the Wolves and the franchise here that they were told officially there's a chance that you can move eventually, but it's not going to be to probably the two prime places because those are ripe for expansion? Yeah, I don't think it's gotten that far down the road. And I get it. Logically speaking, Mm -hmm. A-Rod, connections to Seattle, Vegas, right? The arena is there with the hockey team. Vegas is starving for an NBA franchise. It makes all sorts of logical sense to have NBA franchises in Seattle and Vegas. But no, I have no reason to believe at this point that A-Rod and Lori have gone to the league, have brought that up with Adam Silver and others. Do you think that ultimately this deal does get done? I do. Yeah. I mean, and heck, to use the football cliche back in 2015, six years ago, Glenn Taylor and Steve Kaplan, the then limited partner of the Memphis Grizzlies, got it down to the two-yard line. There were so many people who believed (laughs) a deal was going to happen. Then you go back to August, limited partner for the Grizzlies, ironically speaking, Daniel E. Strauss comes to town. Judd, he came to town with every intention of completing a transaction. Yeah, he had all sorts of lawyers by his side. So would I if I were completing a $1.6 billion transaction, whatever the exact number that Strauss and Glenn Taylor agreed to. I don't know if it was exactly 1.5. Might have been slightly above, right? So Mm -hmm. when Strauss comes to town and thinks, hey, we're going to get this done, then it falls apart for different reasons. We've seen Glenn get cold feet before. But because I've never seen Glenn... This vocal, he made the media rounds on April 8th. He normally doesn't quite go to that extent. He was on CCO radio. You know, he was on The Scoop. He talked to The Athletic. He talked to the newspaper he owns, the Star Tribune. He talked to the Pioneer Press. He talked to the Associated Press. I'm probably leaving out a media outlet or two. Never before do I remember Glenn doing that many interviews. So because Glenn was that frontal, and I get it, things can change, Over the course of 33 days, Glenn has gotten cold feet before. I get it. But because Glenn was so frontal back on April 8th, yeah, I do, Jetta. I think it eventually does get done. Interesting. So, yeah, I I was going to say, though, that sort of comes full circle back to your point about there have been times that he has said too much, though, and he was excited, like you could tell. And, And I think that your point off the top of this scoop is the best point, which is, you know, 2021, am I really supposed to believe that like in four days in Florida around a kitchen table, that deal gets done? I think that's a great point. And, and I wouldn't be, be surprised to tie the two points together that you're making, Doogie, if he did get excited and he's like, this is it and it's A-Rod, it's a huge name, right? And and it's going to get done. And now to your point at that time, he said too much. And now it's not that it won't get done. But I am certainly not going to sit here and say it will for sure because of the amount of times that we've been down different paths with with Glenn and they have not been finalized. That's something, you know, at the at the one yard line on first and goal, we get to fourth down and the team gets stopped. Another reason why I feel relatively confident that it'll eventually get done is Glenn is 80 years old. There is no succession plan within his family. Hey, Becky loves the Wolves and Lynx, his wife, I think more than Glenn. And I'm led to believe that Becky very much is on board with Glenn finally having a succession plan in place. Hopefully Glenn can live, you know, he can be Sid-like, right? He can live for another 20 years. But realistically speaking, yep. the clock is is absolutely ticking on Glenn that having a plan in place is very important to him. Scoop goes where next, sir? Wherever you would like it to go. You know, it looks like some of the national media is picking up on some of the Vikings steam from last week. I saw Josina Anderson hopped in on the Vikings' D.D. Westbrook. Preliminary interest. I don't have a sense right now, Judd, that the Vikings have made Westbrook an offer. I also brought up the name Ryan Kerrigan. I don't have a sense that the Vikings are to the point of extending offers to Westbrook and Kerrigan, but they are kicking the tires to some extent. Westbrook is about seven months removed from ACL surgery. I'm told he is running straight lines. 
He's doing very well in his rehab process. So in theory, you know, barring a setback, come July into August, D.D. Westbrook should be back close to 100%. I still think if they end up adding a receiver, somebody like D.D. makes a lot more sense than Larry Fitzgerald Jr. That I get it because Fitz is out there, former Vikings right. ball boy, that 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 dialogue is is going to occur. And I think he would help the room a lot. But I don't think that room needs a ton of help. I really don't. And, like, are you forced to throw him a certain amount of passes per game? Heck, are you forced to dress him every game? Not to say that D.D. Westbrook is going to help out on special teams a bunch. But he might not. But, play, like, yeah. in a pinch, you know, yeah. if you needed him to return a punt or a kick, he could do that. Like, Fitz, it's a very finite role, right? A very specific role. And it would be a yeah. phenomenal story, don't get me wrong. From a storyline standpoint, sure, sign me up for, for Fitzgerald Jr. But I'm just saying, from a helping the team on the field standpoint, I just don't get the Larry Fitzgerald Jr. chatter. Is Fitz going to play, do you think for sure? And if he does, is he right now um, thinking about signing with a team outside the Cardinals? Because his first choice would be, obviously, to go back there, Dukes. But that depth chart is pretty packed now. So I, I would think that this is a guy w- with his career accomplishments, um, that this is not a guy who would sign with any team. So it would probably be a spe- it would probably be specific teams, right? Yeah, I mean, I think, honest to gosh, Judd, I think it's, you know, maybe one or two or three teams. Like, I think it's Minnesota. Yeah, I think ultimately he'd love to end up back in Arizona. But you're right. I mean, they had A.J. Green. They yeah. draft Rondell Moore. They still have Christian Kirk. They, of course, still have DeAndre Hopkins. They have Andy Isabella. Like, they are stacked. Arizona really doesn't have room for Fitz. So I'm hoping to connect with him at some point. He's his own representation. He no longer has an agent, so the Vikings Good for just him. can deal with him directly or any team can just deal with him directly. He normally hosts a football camp last year because of COVID. It got shut down, but he normally is, is in town at different points June-ish, that if he's in town next month hosting his football camp over at Holy Angels High School, that I hope to get over there. I don't think he's signing anywhere like tomorrow or next right. week. So I think his name will still be percolating like a month from now if he does indeed come to town and host a football camp. Hey, if they don't sign a player, um, what is their plan, do you think, at right defensive end? Because that, that's the, the one that we've certainly talked about in Scoop before. They definitely pursued people, uh, tried to upgrade there. It's the one place that they really didn't land a player. What do you think is is the default position or rotation of guys? Is there a guy that you think they like more than the rest who would at least get the first shot in training camp at that spot? I think it would be a rotation, Judd. Yeah, I mean, they bring back Stephen Weatherly, so there is some sort of you know confidence factor there with – with Weatherly, but I think in an ideal world, he's not playing 55 or 60 snaps. They really like DJ Wanham, the fourth round pick out of South Carolina from a year ago, who showed flashes his rookie year. Now think mm-hmm. about it with, with what appears to be at least more of a semblance of an offseason, more a semblance of of sort of a normal year that, that there should be some leap up for a lot of these. But guys might not guys. show up, right? Well, like they a, might not. Yeah, well, that's, that's the weird something. thing. Yeah, but in terms of just three preseason games, sure. right? Just, there's the some things camp, I think yeah. that, that will help these second-year guys. That, that I do think a lot of second-year guys should take a leap up. So you've got Weatherly, you've got Wanham, you've got the two guys they drafted, the pick kid, the Florida State kid. But you're right, Judd. I mean, they swung and missed on Trey Hendrickson. They mm-hmm. swung and missed on Carl Lawson. So clearly – they were looking to upgrade that position. That's why, to me, there are so many free agents out there. I mean, I brought up the name Ryan Kerrigan, but, like, Melvin Ingram is still out there. Everson Griffin is still out there. I'm leaving out a few names. Like, to me, if you look at the remaining free agents, guys with legitimate NFL experience, I could argue that the spot, the position with the most depth as we sit here on May 11th is defensive end. Interesting. Do you think that there's a better chance that they still sign a defensive end or or a defensive interior tackle who can rush? 
Well, I mean, Geno Atkins is somebody they've inquired about, right? Yes. And you've got the history. Paul Gunther is now, you know, I don't know what his official title is, but he's now on Mike Zimmer's staff. He's got the history with Geno Atkins. Mike Zimmer knows Geno really well. So, like, I can't sit here and tell you 0% chance on Geno Atkins. I think it's one. Like, Sheldon, I know maybe? That's, I know that's a, a bit of a cop out. I haven't heard any Sheldon steam. Not to say that maybe that's not out there. I just haven't heard that okay. personally. But I also need to check on that. I checked on on him like within 24 hours after he hit the market. Didn't hear anything back, and I haven't checked since. So I will now make a mental note of that, Judd, that I will follow up on that here in the coming days. Defensive line question, Dugues, um, to, to go to the left end. As far as, as we know, Hunter's coming in, right? Like the contract's going to get taken care of, it sounds like, at some point in time. It might not be right now. Uh, but there, we don't believe that there is going to be a, a problem there that he's going to sh- show up for training camp. So here's my question. have Do you think that they've discussed um, the one thing that uh, if he comes back and he is healthy, okay? So, like, he's back to being him- himself. Daniil Hunter is probably a top 10 type of player. I mean, he's an outstanding player. Do you think that they've discussed doing with him what Zimmer did in the Saints playoff game? which is moving him around inside occasionally, right end, which I don't think they did uh, in that Saints game. But my point is, it seems to me like this guy, when healthy, is a huge weapon. And if you're not going to have a right end that's absolutely set, wouldn't there be an opportunity, wouldn't it be smart to game plan him so that opponents don't just consistently know that he's going to be trying to rush the quarterback from that left end? That's interesting. There are a few tentacles there. He's coming off a pretty serious surgery. So you would hope that we see the 2019 and 2018 Daniil, but like I need to see it first. I'm not saying it's not happening, but I need to see it coming off that very serious neck surgery. If he is back to the form we saw in 18 and 19 and even 17, Judd, not probably. Like he is a top 10 defensive player. He is that disruptive. So, yes, I will say this. I mean, Zimmer dropped a hint. I can't recall when he did the Zoom with us. Was it a week before the draft, a couple weeks before the draft? But he made some insinuations that that some things are going to change. That that I mean, I know this. He's incredibly pissed off the way his defense played last year. And he should so, be. Like, even with the players coming back, all these players, right, and the additions – there's going to be a tweak or two, right? Like, oh, it's yeah. not possible for Zim just to run things back through and say, okay, we're going to do things exactly the same way. So, yes, I mean, I can't speak specifically, Judd, to, to your idea, but do I think your idea makes sense? Yeah, I do. That that would not shock me. And let me remind folks on Daniil, he's low maintenance. He's not one that likes the spotlight. Yeah, I think eventually – they know they need to give him a bump and pay that he can't be the what is he now, Judd? The seventeenth or eighteenth or nineteenth no. highest paid, like twenties now. Okay, so he's, he's in falling the down that chart. Yeah, so, it's I mean, ridiculous. That, that can't be the case. Yeah. So they know that, and yeah, I think they eventually take care of him. He comes in, and once he's in, as long as he's healthy, I wouldn't necessarily worry about him. He's just not one to like sit out training camp, to create big waves. He's just not a me, me, me type guy. Twin scoopage. It's a mess. What's the scoop? It is, although like when they play a nine-inning game, they're not horrendous, <laughs> right? I mean, 0-7 in extra inning games, 0-4 in seven-inning games. You're damning yeah. them with faint praise, my man. I know. They know that they need to fix the bullpen. They let it be known, Judd, to Rex Gary, the agent for Shane Green, that yep. they were willing to go higher than what the Braves got Green at. So I think the number is 1.5, 1.5 million, and that may even be prorated. So in real money, that's like 1.2 or 1.3 for the rest of the season, maybe even below that, maybe closer to 1.2 or 1.15. So it's not like the Braves broke the bank for – a pretty good reliever. Like, I'm not going to sit here and tell you Shane Green is an exceptional reliever, a top 10 reliever, but he's got a pulse. He's capable. He's more than capable. I think he's I think he's pretty good, he's right? Like, like, you know, the ceiling for Shane Green 
yeah. he'll take it, right? So yeah, he can help the you. Twins let Rex Gary know, hey, we're willing to go higher than Atlanta. It sounds like, and Twins fans don't want to hear this, right? They they think that that free agents just don't want to come here, right? In this instance, I can only go case by case. In this instance, Green has a history, not a lengthy history, but he has mm-hmm. a history with the Atlanta Braves. There's a comfort level there. When joining a team middle of the season, it just, like, you connect all these logical dots, and I get why Shane Green chose the Atlanta Braves, but just know this, the Twins tried really hard on Shane Green. So who's next? Who else is out there? I'm told nothing cooking on David Robertson, the former Yankee, you know, well-known reliever. He's out there right now. As of yesterday, now this can change, but as of yesterday, I checked, zero cooking, Twins and Robertson. But there's some other guys out there. Heck, there's a guy or two that hits the waiver wire that's DFA'd seemingly on a daily basis. So By the Twins or daily. Well, yeah, well, the Twins, but – you know, all across the game. But yeah, the Twins certainly have made a, a yes. number of moves too. But but I think at some point here, they're going to add somebody. Trading for a guy right now yep. is not particularly easy, right? Like teams aren't aren't looking to, to move relievers right this second. But just know that behind the scenes, the Twins front office is, is working pretty darn hard to help fix that bullpen. Dukes, how surprised do you think the Twins themselves are by this start? I think pretty surprised. I mean, I think like even shaken or because I mean, I this is just awful. Shaken. Yeah, I mean, it has been awful. I mean, I can't, I can't for the life of me get out of my mind. Uh, maybe it's the negativity that's in my mind. My wife keeps telling me, stop thinking negative, more positive thoughts. But that afternoon loss in Oakland, no, with, I disagree with, with Lankenhorn and, and Arise, like that one. And like, I think the front office, you know, I'm pretty sure on this, the front office. You know, and this was in real time. It's the ultimate second guess, but in real time, they never understood taking Josh Donaldson out of that game. Remember, Donaldson came out, so then Blankenhorn goes to second, Arise goes from second to third. Blankenhorn and Arise end up making, I mean, just hard to comprehend errors, and the Twins lose that game after, was it Buxton who hit the home run? Like, they actually scored in extra innings. That was the one game where, where they scored. Right, the mm-hmm. offense didn't fail them in extra innings. Right, so I think that one loss, like if if you got Derek Falvey or Thad Levine to talk to you on the record and be completely transparent, if you had talked to them that Wednesday night after that Wednesday afternoon loss in Oakland, they would have told you they were really, really pissed off and did not understand, you know, how that game was lost and and some of the strategy involved. But I don't know if I can sit here and tell you, Judd, that. It's to the point of that they are shaken. I will add this, though. So Sunday was the conclusion of this so-called easy 16-game stretch, and Sunday was rained out, so it was, what, 15 games. Look at their record in those 15 games. You lose three of four to the lowly Rangers. You lost a series to the Pittsburgh Pirates. You didn't play well in Cleveland when you didn't have to face Shane Bieber. And now tonight starts a stretch where – you're playing what looks like teams that will finish above 500 for like the next two or three weeks. I mean, this tonight starts a pretty aggressive stretch for the Twins. So I just think looking back at those 15 games, these so-called easy 15 games, with the Twins losing all the games they did in that 15-game stretch, I think that tells us plenty. And I was wrong. I mean, Judd, I didn't have them as good as you did at 96 <laughs> wins, but we Thanks, talked Dukes. We talked – you know, on March 25th or whatever, you know, shortly before opening day, March 28th. I think I predicted 89 or 90 wins. I predicted a division championship. So, like, if I could take back that prediction, yeah, I think I have seen enough that that it's hard for me without, you know, some reinforcements. But looking at the roster now, the injury situation, all the injuries they've already had, the the injuries injuries that uh, inevitably will come, Judd, I – it just it's hard for me to see them winning the division this year. What is the um patience cuz it, it's got to be ticking. What is the patience on Sano? Because I mean, he looks completely lost. This is not a short slump now. I it's it's you know, besides the two week stretches, this is a prolonged period. Um remarkably, I can say this with complete confidence. Miguel Sano right now is a better first baseman than he is hitter. 
Like, that's remarkable to say, but he is. What's the patience there, and at what point in time do you potentially have to punt? Well, I mean, what's the alternative? I mean, I do think that that they think his pitch selection has improved. The numbers certainly speak to that, that, that the walks have gotten better, but you didn't pay yeah, him $10 he, million dollars a year to walk. Yeah, exactly right. He's not Vince yeah, I mean, Coleman. I, you know, he's not stealing him power. Yeah, exactly. you're paying him for some doubles and for some home runs. And yeah, in that regard, Judd, he's a complete train wreck. But I'm just saying, with with Alex Kirilov sidelined... Well, that's what... Yeah, but I'm saying... Just, once there really comes, isn't a healthy alternative. But once Kirilov comes back... But my, my point is patience long-term here, too. Like, at what point in time do well, you say, this just does, is not going to work? I don't think you're DFAing him anytime real soon. It's not like he has trade value. So I, I think you just you need to ride it out to some extent. Sure. Hope I mean, presumably at some point, but I'm, he's going to go on some sort of hot stretch that that you can ride that wave. Heck, if if some team wants to call and engage you at that point in some trade chatter, but I just don't see it. Let's not forget too. There's there's been some off the field flags with him. I just I don't see it across the league that that teams are saying, yeah, let's trade for Miguel Sano. No, probably not. But if this continues to track a- as it is right now, and I don't have a lot of confidence, Dukes, that it's not going to continue to be difficult. Like I, th- I just don't think they're nearly as good as we all thought. Uh, if this continues to track like this, I think the rest of 2021, Doogie, is about discovery on on or making decisions on Sano, Kepler, Polanco, and that crew. And the second part is is getting Kirloff back, hopefully soon, if he d- does not need wrist surgery, and Larnick and playing them. Like I'm, I'm done with the Jake Cave is playing. I'm done with Ostadia. He can, they can play occasionally, but I think you have to pivot at some point pretty soon here to making decisions um, for 2022 because this cannot go into a prolonged, you know, 2011. We're going to be bad for four years. Uh, so I really think that there has to be a change in philosophy to, well, Jay Cave gives us a chance. No, he doesn't. All right? <laughs> so Larnick plays, Kirilov plays, get Buxton back, he plays, Kepler, Polanco, just finding out because you're going to have some decisions to make, I think, without question, once 2021 is done. Well, yeah, I mean, you will. We're starting to see it to some extent, right? Trevor Larnick is yeah. up, yeah. right? Thankfully, like that to me was an easy move, but I'm not convinced they always would have made the move. But in this instance, they made that move. Maybe let's see why Nick Gordon was a top seven, top five. What was he, the fifth overall pick that draft? Yeah. 2014, number six, whatever. He was a top 10 pick in 2014. Now I get it. He loves his music. Maybe baseball mm-hmm. isn't his first love, but he was a top 10 pick for a reason, even though it was seven years ago. But maybe give him some at bats. Let's see if if he can do some stuff, right? So Absolutely. I'm okay with that. I'm with you. I'm I'm Jake caved out, you know. So when Buxton is back, the hope is that it's more like three or four weeks, that it's not six to eight weeks. That when he's back, maybe that's the roster move. At that point, you cut the cord on Jake Cave when Buxton is ready to go. What do you do with Buxton? Well. You know what? I didn't get it at the time. I thought it was a BS move at the time years ago when the Twins held him back from calling him up that September, manipulated the service time, even though they can never admit that on the record. Yeah. But hey, guess what? Buxton could have been, if they had called him up that September, Buxton could have been a free agent after this year. <laughs> How complicated would that have been if Buxton hit the open market this November? Now at least you have another year to see how it goes. But Judd, it's been one injury after another, you know, and and I don't think a lot of these injuries have been of the fluky nature. Like he plays incredibly hard, but like there's this inevitability, unfortunately, that even when he comes back, let's say he's back by June 15th, one month from now, that at some point, June 28th, July 7th, that he's going to suffer another injury. That's just to the point we're at. So, I think what you do is you don't extend him at this point unless the Buxton camp completely changes tune, agrees to a, a lengthy contract with multiple team options. But I, I struggle to see that. So I think you just let this thing play out. Let's see where we are, you know, one year from now, August of, 
of 2022. He can become a free agent November of 2022 at just 29 years old. Like George Springer at 31 just got six years, 150 million from the Blue Jays. All it takes is one team, right? So if you're Buxton, find a way to stay healthy next year. And if you do that and hit the open market at 29, Judd, I still think one team would pay him a lot of money. I agree. But the problem is it, it probably can't be the Twins because if you write that check, it's going to stop you from pursuing uh, um, different players. And here's the problem. If you thought the Maurer contract was a problem, imagine a Buxton you know, six-year contract. Like, Because you're right, Doogie. He's always... I love him, and I think he's tough. So I am not saying that, that he dogs it. I don't think that. But the reality is he's always hurt. So imagine two years in where he's just not playing and he's not, not playing and the Twins don't sign guys because they signed him. Again, it, it would make the Maurer thing look small by comparison, I think. Well, yeah, and, and you're right about his toughness. I mean, if you ask me to rank you know, the, the toughness of guys in that Twins clubhouse, Buxton would be – Top three. Like, I know that. Like, you never need to worry about work ethic or toughness with Buck. But you're right. Like, I don't know how you would pay him $100 million. I will say, with the power that's come, you know, because there was a concern before we saw this power surge that yep. you absolutely can't pay a speed guy into his 30s, right? As Buxton hits the age 30, 31, 32, that you don't want to be paying him $22 million a year that you would believe that the speed would eventually diminish, right? But now that he's got the power, I would think that power is sustainable ages 29, 30, 31, 32. But, yeah, I get it, Judd. I, I just I don't know how it would be the Twins paying him over $100 million. It probably would be a different team. Concern on, on the drop in velocity, Tyler Duffy. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how to explain it. We started to see it in Fort Myers. So it's not like it's a completely new phenomenon. I mean, we saw it in mid-March. I don't know how to explain it. He was so darn good 2019, 2020. I mean, he's another guy. As you talk about Kepler and Polanco and some of the other guys, you need to mention Duffy. You know, regression yeah. just stinks, you know? And, and like, uh, so many guys in 2019 had career years, right? You're starting to wonder, and the ball was, was juiced from. Yeah, maybe, but you're starting to wonder, man, oh man, like how much did the Twins just blow it in 2019? You know, not even winning one playoff game, right? Like just making some sort of run in October. That that 2019 yep. roster, you know, even without Josh Donaldson, that 2019 roster was the year to really make a run. Not that the window is completely closed, but they are going to need to make some some pretty. You know, maybe significance and overstatement, but, you know, relatively strong tweaks this upcoming winter that that for the window to open up a little bit larger for 2022 and 2023, a few mm -hmm. moves need to take place. And, you know, at this point, again, I'm suggesting that, that I don't see it this year unless, you know, unless multiple reinforcements come the next couple months. It's hard to see them making any sort of run this year. Duke, if this continues for the Twins, who do you see um, from this core group of players possibly being dealt by the deadline? Well, I mean, look at all the pending free agents. I mean, what's the point in having Jay Happ? What's the point in having Robles, right? I mean, Robles has been pretty good out of the bullpen. You yeah. know, everybody's going to be looking for a bullpen arm, right? Go make a shrewd trade. Like, I was reminded watching Phillies Braves the other night. The Braves threw this pitcher – is the pronunciation on the last name? It's Y N O A. Anyway, the Twins, the Twins had him in their system. They right. traded him for Jaime Garcia a few years ago. Then remember that the Twins then shipped Garcia to New York a few days later for Zach Littell and another pitcher. But yeah. like, it took four or five years for this for this youngster to to reach the majors. But now he's been lights out for the Braves. So trade Robles for some arm that we don't even know, right, that that Baseball America would have to do a deep dive on to educate us on. But go mm -hmm. go make a trade like that. So I just I would look at any pending free agent. If if some American League contender wants Nelly Cruz, you know, I think you'd have to explore that. Like any pending free agent Simmons. for sure. And if you're looking at maybe, 
you know, too many outfielders, especially if you like Celestino, some other guys coming up through the system. Yep. Like if if somebody has interest in Max Kepler, like I would listen. But hey, Kepler wasn't great in 2020. He hasn't been great this year. Like he can play center field, so that helps. But it's not like teams are knocking down the door for corner outfielders. I know. I know. And Kepler and Polanco scare me now. Like, I don't know who they, they are. And that's my point is I think you have to find out. I ha- I think that you have to find out by the end of this year, are the, these guys a semblance of what you got in 2019? Are they more what you got in 2020 into now? Is, is there somewhere between those two places? Uh, that's my point about why I think – it's all about discovery and the discovery of who do we want, who don't we want, because to go back to your point, 2019, looking more and more like a lot of guys, Garver, Kepler, Polanco, just had career years. And those years yeah. are oh, you know, yeah. long gone now. Yeah, I mean, heck, Bill Smith, other other former baseball executives, current baseball executives will tell you, like, to just assume – that you can run things back the next year and guys will will duplicate what they did the year before is the ultimate misnomer. Like yep. you have to expect regression in some form with with a handful of guys. Not every guy because some guys are going to tick up. But just there are so many examples over the years that so many guys, you know, peak and then the next year or two the numbers dip pretty significantly and like we're seeing that Right now, and I think you're right. I mean, I don't think they're trading Max Kepler, you know, by July 31st or July 30th, whenever the non-waiver deadline is this year, late July. Like, I think sure. Max Kepler will be here in August. I think Jorge Polanco probably will be here in August. So, yeah, run it through the entire year, then make a determination in the winter, October, November. Okay, who do we have in Kepler? Who do we have in Polanco? Those are pretty tradable contracts that – you know, I talk about Buxton, all it would take is one team. Like, I think there would be a team out there that would make you a decent offer in Jorge Polanco in particular, mm-hmm. that, that they would look at that 2019 season, you know, that, that all-star season and say, you know what, that contract isn't ridiculous. You know, it's it's hard to find middle infielders. Heck, he's got some position flexibility. Like, you're fine if Polanco's your shortstop. I get what, what the chin, Twins did upgrading with Simmons, but – if Jorge Polanco is your starting starting shortstop, fine. Yeah, so be it. Right. Agreed. So I I wouldn't be shocked if 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 they do ultimately explore some of those trade talks. It would be in the winter, not at the deadline. Final scoop, sir. What what else do you got for us? Well, so on the Gophers men's basketball program, so Marcus Fuller had a story of the Star Tribune on Monday about Booth Gotch, the Austin, Minnesota native, transferred in a year ago from Utah was a good player for the Utah Utes in the Pac-12, then came here, and he was part of the reason why the Gophers had a bad year. He just he did not play well, underwent surgery after the season, so he was playing hurt to some extent. So Marcus has a story Monday that Booth Gotch is going to enter the transfer portal, which I know Marcus has, has great sources. I, I think somebody maybe multiple people told him and he had every reason to write that but i can just tell you going back and forth with some people internally a mentor of of gotchas heck i've texted booth himself who normally gets back to me mm-hmm. it's really weird the silence or the confusion being texted back to me on hmm. this so i just i'm going to keep an eye on that you know what happens with with booth gotch there is an injury situation that that I'll just leave it at that with the okay. Gophers men's basketball team right now. Just know this. They are looking for multiple front court players, but the front court needs all sorts of help. I still think – I said this the day Ben Johnson got hired. I still believe it. What Ben needs to do, the big key for Ben, is the 2022 recruiting class. That I get it. Fans want to see victories this upcoming season. But I want to give Ben a full year of recruiting. That that He was brought in mostly for his recruiting prowess. But I want to see what his 2022 recruiting class looks like. He has a lot of scholarships to play with. There are a ton of players here in the state of Minnesota that can play in the Big Ten that are in that 2022 high school class. I think Ben's going to land some of them. 
Can he land upwards of four or five, or is it more like two or three? But I want to evaluate Ben on the 2022 recruiting class, then that season on. Then I'm sure. not I'm not completely wiping away this year. We'll learn plenty about Ben as an in-game right. coach, other right. other things that we can evaluate Ben on. But like I have very low expectations for the Gophers this year that I'm keying in on that 2022 recruiting class. But it is fascinating that if Booth ends up going elsewhere, that the only player back from last year's team is Isaiah Enan. And that's why Ben can hire any staff he wants. But Ed Conroy had interest in staying. He's now on Jerry Stackhouse's staff at Vanderbilt. If he stays, and Ben knows Ed, Liam Robbins stays. That I thought Liam was important enough to keep here that I would have kept Ed Conroy on staff Ed's been a head coach before, low ego. Like, I think Ed could have fit in just fine on, on Ben's staff, but I think Ben maybe looked at it and said, Dave Thorson, always my guy, you know, upper-aged Caucasian. Can right. I then hire Ed Conroy, upper-aged right. Caucasian? Can I have two upper-aged Caucasians on my staff? You know, so I think that entered into the mix to, to some degree, but I'm just saying me personally – I would have kept Ed Conroy on staff to keep Liam Robbins. But if Gotch ends up elsewhere, only Isaiah Enan. Like, that's hard to fathom. Only Isaiah Enan. Free agency, Not that last dude. year's team was any good. But, like, to only have Isaiah Enan back? Man alive. But there's some guys going through the pre-draft process, Steph Mitchell, the Shakopee native in particular, that I don't think are going to keep their names in the draft that the Gophers can land. Like, there are good vibes remaining to this day on Steph Mitchell, the Boston College transfer. So, like, if you're fixated on this upcoming season, more is coming. Like, you can look at the roster right now, but the roster is incomplete. Just know that more is coming. It might be six weeks from now, not one week, but more is coming to, to next season's Gophers roster. Great stuff, Dukes. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay, we'll talk, see you, Jed. Bye-bye. Talk to you.